Um, Lori and Stephen described the mood at Davos on um, globalization and the geopolitical risks, and I don't think this, we've ever had a more complicated time that I, that, that I can remember. Certainly there's a lot of change out there. How has what we've learned from this whole Davos debate influenced the way Ashburton uh, <coughs> thinks about its investment strategy and how, and how we allocate for our clients? First thing I just want to say is that nothing changes the way we filter information. But we get lots of different information. So we go to Davos and we try and, and disseminate what's coming out of it. We are unashamedly and unambiguously a macro house. So the macro angle drives our conclusions in terms of investment. So yes, the world is changing. There's no debate about that. What we look at from a, from a filtering point of view is to what degree I'm doing the Donald Trump thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed that myself now. Okay. <laughs> Watch out about that. Yeah. As we look at earnings, okay, and we look at earnings around the world and corporates that we invest in, and earnings and the earnings potential and uh, potential for growth, we look at the cost of capital, what's going to happen to interest rates, because everything has a cost of capital implication. We look at currencies, what's going to happen in terms of currencies. And we look at, at, at thematics, to what degree is the world changing and where should we have our biases. So this is essentially how we look at, uh, at the issues. Uh, more specifically, um, I, I don't want to repeat uh, what's been said here, but the world has changed. Um, the United States is becoming a different animal. And I, I just want to say also that we are not going to propose what we think is right or what we think is wrong. Uh, we can have our own personal views in terms of what we think should happen, but we spend most of our energy in terms of what we think could happen. Right? So we're not going to propose, we're not going to moralise. What we are going to uh, determine is the state of the world and how it's going to affect how we invest funds on our clients' behalf. In terms of the United States, uh, it's, it's very, very interesting. You know, Donald Trump will tweet in the middle of the night and he can have an influence on the, on the dollar. And it, with one fell swoop, he makes all the other nations, especially the Mexicans, very competitive. You know, with, with one fell swoop, even though he's trying to do the opposite. So in terms of, of the way we look at uh, the whole United States story, we are of the view that things have changed quite dramatically. We are of the view that things are still very, very uncertain. The tax policy that he is purporting to, uh, to impose with the Republicans on uh, the United States, we have this thing called the destination-based tax, which is very, very um, conducive to encouraging exports and hugely penal in terms of imports. So we look at that, we look at the kind of companies we, we invest in, um, we look at what impact that has on the dollar, for argument's sake, because when that happens, effectively what's going to happen is their current account deficit, it's a deficit nation, starts to, to narrow. And of course that means that you have to sell less dollars, uh, which basically means that the dollar is going to drive up. And when the dollar drives up, the nation becomes less competitive. So the way we look at the world in terms of that is, is quite important. The other issue is that the stimulus that he talks about um, introducing, by way of uh, tax cuts, by way of infrastructural spending. It's coming what we call very late cycle. So he doesn't have a lot of room to manoeuvre in terms of the amount of people who can work in the United States, which basically means that there is a, this thing called inflation coming on back onto the table. The Federal Reserve is likely to react to that uh, because that's part of their mandate. And we have been in a situation over the last seven years where we've had a very, very low interest rate environment. And we need to understand the impact of a rising interest rate environment in terms of how we look at valuing the future earning streams back to the present value. So these are some of the headwinds that start coming through. So, so there are pros, there are cons, uh, in terms of the under, and we're going too long. In terms of, the, um, in terms of under underlying profitability, yes, there are some very powerful uh, tailwinds coming through. But from a valuation point of view, there are still certainly some, some, some headwinds. See, we're going on a bit long, but no, I just... <laughs> but, he's, um, he's the economist. Uh, <laughs> it's a Donald Trump. But just, the one, so quick, just the one thing that's on my mind. So learning everything we can from all this debate, does the sort of allocation between SA and offshore change for for us as South African investors? I think, I think the way we look at, at offshore is we look at it from a risk diversification perspective. You know, South Africa is, what, half a percent of the world economic environment, um, and uh, we have a very small uh, market cap um, in terms of how we can invest. So, so offshore is very important from our point of view. What we do at Ashburton, obviously, is we say, look, what can we um, realistically get by way of a return in the South African environment? Now, just look, for example, at our interest rates. We can get, by investing just in cash over the next 12 months, 8.5%. You do that overseas, and you're getting virtually nothing, right? So basically, you're taking a view, just from a cash point of view, that the rand should depreciate by at least that, for you to gen generate a, um, 
a motivation to get a better performance in the offshore space. So we look at it through, through that, uh, that, that, that prism as well. But has, has the, have things changed? Things have changed to some degree. Maybe we're going to be a little bit more um, em emphasising of certain nations. For example, in the European space, we think the European equity market is pretty cheap at the moment. So th does, does our approach actually change? The answer is no. Where are we at the moment? Um, we think that the RAND is probably not going to depreciate by that much uh, from current levels. And on that basis, we, we're not that um, enthused in terms of putting too much money in the offshore space. But offshore still remains a very important component part of how we invest. So incurring these, in these uncertain times, um, this fourth industrial revolution, this fascinating topic, robotics, artificial intelligence, what it means in terms of jobs. Um, what, what have you learned from this debate at Davos and, and how is it kind of affecting the way you think about our portfolios in terms of actually what the kind of boring SA Inc. is doing on this and also these exciting new tech companies? What are, you, what are your thoughts there? Um, so Rob, maybe you know, we can approach it from the opportunities perspective. Um, and uh, Paolo mentioned that the theme this year at Davos was um, responsive and responsible leadership. And in the face of the fourth industrial revolution, um, that's going to be key in terms of how organizations and governments um, are responsive to, to this um, revolution. Um, now, from, as a South African investor, there are, you know, if you look at the JSC, it's very limited in terms of your options, in terms of how you access uh, tech companies and robotics. Um, and investors are probably going to have to start being quite discerning in terms of, of how they make um, their offshore allocation. Obviously, there are the, the, globally, there are a lot more um, listed names that one could access. I mean, there's Google's um, a company called iRobot, which is up 95% year on year, um, and, and all of them participating in either your daily lives, the Internet of Things, or some of them basically um, ensuring that industries and sectors become a lot more efficient and productive through automation. Now, in the South African space, uh, one of those sectors is uh, banking, and probably uh, Lori could weigh in here. But banking, I mean... Um, especially if you look across the continent. So you could arguably uh, say that um, Africa leapfrogged the industrial age and basically met us in the digital age where um, there have been platforms that have been built around payment solutions and how um, banks look at loans and how an, an entrepreneur in Africa has developed um, just through automation alone, which is very different to the way that we've interacted with our banks in South Africa. Um, there's mining, perhaps, where automation could uh, mean um, significant benefits for their profitability. I mean, um, not just uh, from a cost perspective and improving margins, but also how efficient they are in terms of um, power usage, water usage on the mines, and how automation fits in there, because those kind of benefits hit the bottom line directly. Now, um, and, and those are just some of the... The, the opportunities that exist for net, from an investor's perspective in terms of looking maybe as a South African investor at the sectors that are likely to, to benefit if they obviously use that, um, the, the resources that they have on hand. So banking, again, very rich in terms of data and the data that they warehouse, they could um, manipulate that or, or use it to, to their benefit insurance and, uh, um, uh, and banking tend to benefit there. But obviously there are pitfalls and concerns and very warranted concerns. So, you know, what about my job? Um, McKinsey, it, it's been noted that they did a study or carried out a study um, that between 1997 and 2007 in the US, uh, blue collar work was mainly lost through automation. So about 86% of the jobs that were lost in the US between those years was through automation, with the 14% being due to new trade agreements with China. So, you know, uh, Trump... So lots of, com lots of um, issues, but lots of opportunity as well. Absolutely, yeah. So, so, so Wayne, we've, we've, we've covered the kind of um, asset allocation story from, from, from Mark. And Kareng's kind of given us uh, insights into how you can play the, this artificial intelligence. I think China's kind of key to both. China seemed to take the high ground at Davos with the Chinese president um, uh, sort of em emptying the space, being vacated by the US, and Jack Ma really coming out there as the CEO of Alibaba and, and kind of conveying how 
great his business model is. So what's your take on China now and what it means for us? Well, look, I mean, obviously you don't know what essentially a maverick or something that or somebody that you're not in familiar with or seems to be on the edge. You know, you just don't know. So you don't know what Trump's actually going to do. But I can promise you globalization trade is like a cat that's had many lives. You know, it has been around forever since the Second World War. Mm. It obviously took a huge leap forward in the 1990s with the fall in communism. So globalization is a trend that's been in place for a long time. Now, Trump in his first 100 days has got to make statements, he's got to do things. So the first things he's done is he's cancelled the North Atlantic Partnership Agreement and the Pacific Partnership Agreement. Now, this wasn't law. These were potential trade agreements. They weren't law. And in fact, Hillary Clinton was against the Pacific one, even though she was one of the people who negotiated it. So it shows you how public sentiment can change, how politicians see things. So he's cancelled those two agreements, but understand they were not in place. They weren't law yet. And China has said specifically, we will clearly defend our rights in terms of the World Trade Organization. You know, and as, as, as Stephen spoke about, and Lowry, it seems very ironic that a communist country is lecturing capitalism, countries about capitalism. But we will evaluate the situation. I don't think it's going to be catastrophic. There's just too much danger to the US economy, let alone the world economy, if you really start to reverse you know, decade-long trends in the world. So we'll have to see, and as we all well know, there's a great difference between what politicians say and what they do. Absolutely. So, so Shalon, I, mean, I, I think one of the massive questions facing us is this whole reflation trade. All, everything we're talking about comes back to interest rates and the secular decline in, in US rates since the early 80s. Um, what's your view? Where, what's Ash Burton's fixed income positioning? And yeah. Yeah. So before I answer the question, I just want to make two points on <clears throat> uh, that to, to pick up on things Laurie said. So I think this panel here is about really giving you some alerts rather than in depth insights. And I think this hopefully gives, gives you uh, uh, food for thought in terms of what you need to be looking at further. The second point I wanted to pick up on was taking jobs back to America. You know, in addition to some jobs not being, some jobs being lowly skilled, um, you know, the, the largest diamond polishing center in the world, most people probably not aware of it, but is in a place called Surat, which is where my family hails from, but in, in India in a state called Gujarat. So uh, that tr uh, trade has been handed down over generations. So it's not taking the diamond polishing jobs back to the US anytime soon. Just getting back to bonds, uh, the soundbite here, or the alert here, for me anyway, is um, I think people need to begin to separate the bond market, offshore in particular, between the nominal bond market or the fixed bond market and the inflation-linked bond market. And this is going to be a very, very important thing. And I think the two markets behave almost independently of each other. And, 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 and when I say that, let me explain what I mean. In the US, you've got, um, roughly speaking, an $11 trillion treasury bond market, nominal bonds, and roughly a three quarters of a trillion, uh, $750 billion worth of inflation-linked treasuries. There's $4 trillion worth of pension liabilities in the US, which needs to find a, um, an asset to back those liabilities. That asset is an inflation-linked bond. So there's $4 trillion that's going to be chasing $750 billion. Real yields in the U.S. are still positive. So real yields in the U.S., you can still get, you know, out, call it 50 basis points of real yield. If you go across the pond, you go to U.K. and Europe, um, I'm, I'll give you a number uh, which will surprise you. The yield, the real yield on a 50-year government-issued inflation-linked bond in the U.K. is minus 1.5%. 50 years. So you give your money to the government, minus 1.5% real, you lose the real value of your money. Over in Europe, in France, it's minus 60 basis points. So these markets are very bifurcated. So as bond yields begin to rise, I'm pretty sure we'll see nominal bond yields rise. You'll see fixed bond yields go up. There is a natural cap on where inflation-linked bond yields in developed markets will go. Um, and the reason for that is there is a natural demand for those, um, uh, for those bonds. And I've you know, just in terms of my background and why I say this, I mean, I've, I've spent a, a fair bit of time working in, the, in that inflation-linked bond market, in, in the sterling inflation-linked bond market. So I've seen the demand, and I've seen how price agnostic the buyer can be. So that's the, the, the first point I would make. Turning this back to home, I would just say the following. Mark's made the point 
you know, cash is, is call it eight, eight and a half percent. You know, our outlook for bonds for this year in the South African bond market is call it eight percent from, um, from government bonds. From an investment grade corporate bond portfolio, you're looking at a, at, at a, at a return of potentially nine and a half to 10 percent. So, you know, begin to think about nine and a half percent on investment grade corporate bonds and then think about your equity portfolio and begin to, you know, weigh up the relative value. Bonds are still a good diversifier. Um, but they still offer a, you know, quite, quite a good rate. And the, and the big elephant in the room is rising interest rates will obviously have an impact on the capital value of these bond portfolios. So there's something to be said for revisiting how much of fixed bond exposure you actually have, so fixed exposure to fixed rate bonds, and, and looking more closely at how you, and how you protect that. Um, so those are my comments on, on, on the SA bonds. Great comments, thanks. Um, so, uh, Mark, interest rates up, interest rates, secular lows, well, aren't, aren't all other asset prices overstated? And aren't, aren't we actually uh, potentially heading into some very murky waters there? Well, re remember what, what might happen here. Is, is We talk about fiscal stimulus, and fiscal stimulus, and we talk about tax cuts, and that boosts earnings. So what we're looking at very closely is even though the way we discount or the, the rate at which we discount those future earnings back goes up, there is the potential for those earnings to move ahead and move ahead quite strongly. And that's quite important in terms of how we, we, we understand this. The other thing which we need to understand is that interest rates have been abnormally low. Now, we don't believe they're going to go back to the old normal, but we do believe they will, what we call the new normal, which is normalized slowly but surely. But uh, in, in that instance, you get a cross-correlation between asset classes. There has been a, a situation where um, bond markets have done exceptionally well for you, equity markets have done exceptionally well for you, with low interest rates, right? Now all of a sudden it's a different ball game. Now uh, we're saying maybe bonds are not going to do so well. Maybe they're not going to be as well correlated with equities. Now we're saying that, hang on, equities need to come to the party in terms of earnings growth. And we're looking at the, the threats to that, but we're also looking at, uh, at the potential opportunities there. Where we are a little less uh, convicted, certainly as Shailen said, is in the offshore space. Uh, the bond market does not look particularly attractive to us. In the local context, by the way, we have a different view. Our view is that we are going to get a reduction in inflation in general terms. We're fairly constructive in terms of our view on the RAND. We're fairly constructive in terms of the fact that the, the drought is not going to continue. Um, the, the inflation rate will come down. But that generates a real return, right? And real returns are not that prevalent globally. So we're saying that, that that particular story is looking reasonably okay, and bonds in the South African context, and we as Ashburton have an overweight position in bonds. We did exceptionally well last year. We still think there's value in that bond space based on our expectation of the inflation experience we're likely to get uh, this year. Globally, we're moving a bit more towards the growthier side of things, a bit more towards the equity side of things. In fact, even the local context, we think things are starting to improve a little bit. Downward revisions to earnings have stopped. We're starting to actually see some upward revisions to earnings coming through, and we're starting to put some more money on the table in terms of, of equity. Great, thanks. So I hope you've given everybody um, a sense of uh, uh, the sort of the Ashburton investing process and how it, how it takes cognizance of these very complicated uh, global dynamics that... Um, sort of intellectual at, at Davos, thanks very much, Larry, gives us the, the, um, the opportunity to consider deeply. Great. Thank you so much for, for joining us and uh, participating in the debate. Thank you.